Um, welcome. So welcome to Remote Rehab's fourth uh, webinar in our series. So we have done some webinars on remote assessment, um, assessing capacity to change with our patients, the patient experience of remote rehab. And today we are doing the MDT perspectives on remote rehabilitation. So we'll be going through presentations from occupational therapists, speech therapists, physios, um, who are working with stroke and ABI. Um, and we're, we're really excited to share what we're doing. So just to let you know, we are going to be having presentations from Paul Lucas, who is the founder of Proactive Home Physio. And then we'll be having a presentation from Sarah Gaz Awi, a speech and language therapist, um, who will be sharing her perspectives. And then we'll have a presentation from Hayley Churchill and Philly Young, who are occupational therapists. And then Ben Chetland, who's a community neuro occupational therapist, and Martin Hillier, who's a placement consultant, um, who will be talking about remote group working. If you have any questions, if you, so Caro um, from Remote Rehab will be on the Q&A. So if you leave your questions in the Q&A, then she may respond to them or we may flag them for our panelists to answer at the end. Um, and if you have anything that you want to just say um, to individual panelists or to other uh, participants, then you can post those in the chat. If you would like the slides, then you can join our mailing list. If you email us, if you go to www.rrc.life and then you'll be able to join our mailing list and get the slide decks. Um, and if you want to see this webinar again, then you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, okay, so without further ado, we're gonna start with our first presentation that's from Paul. Okay. Good, e good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Lucas, and I'm the founder of Proactive Home Physio. And I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint now. I, I run a sort of a community based physiotherapy service um, in Northamptonshire. And um, I treat patients post stroke and those that are living with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and elderly clients that have mobility issues. Um, so today, this evening, I'm going to be just sharing some of the tips and hints that um, I've sort of picked up from my own practice when delivering physio using tele-rehab, uh, but also sort of sharing some comments from other therapists and my peers. Um, so a few tips generally. Um, being organised with a set plan for the session, I think that was the key piece of feedback that I've heard from a lot of my peers that um, you pick up where the patient wants to go with a session when you're perhaps in their home or in a clinic but uh, delivering the session over tele rehab we're having to be a lot more organized um, to keep the flow of the session continuing um, so emailing a plan of the session in advance is a, a really good first first point uh, and also having equipment and exercise sheets to hand uh, or to share on your screen so that you can go along with them. Um, so as a physio, often we work with patients that have balance issues. Um, so some of the practical tips are really just ensuring that the, you know, the safety aspects are in place, um, risk assessing whether your patient is going to be able to um, complete the exercises safely. Um, often, I found that so far really using uh, tele-rehab to deliver um, sort of more standing based balance exercises, some, some dynamic elements as well, but just ensuring that they have a care or a family member that can assist them. Um, I've been asking myself the question and asking the patient the question, sort of how confident do you feel about this next movement? And I think that's a really, a really good thing to get the patient thinking about what they feel they could manage because clearly you're not going to be directly next to them to um, support them so there's an, an element of trust 
Um, but again, that question applies to the family member as well. So, you know, how confident do you feel that you could support your relative with this exercise? Um, and again, talking through it first with clear and specific directions to the patient and also their care or family member. And uh, giving uh, advice about reducing the risk of falls uh, can be delivered quite easily over tele rehab. The lower limb is much the same, really. Um, obviously, seated strengthening and stretching exercises can be done fairly safely. Um, and also, standing strengthening and stretching exercises. Bed exercises, obviously, if the camera angle is up, the patient has a camera facing their bed. You can look at sort of bed mobility. Uh, I've included mobility on there as well, but this would be sort of, you know, there'd be a dynamic element to this clearly. So you'd be sort of relying on a, perhaps a family member to sort be the camera person and using tele rehab enables the patient to sort of perhaps record a video clip of their gait pattern and uh, they can email you it and we, you know, it can be, uh, you can discuss it in the next sort of session. Upper limb, um, upper limb stretches really can be uh, quite easily taught with modeling. So demonstrating the stretch in the camera uh, allows the patient to see what they need to do. Um, some of the upper limb exercises, you would sort of have to be quite clear about the specific instructions as well. And particularly sort of from experience working with patients that have had strokes, um, having a family member to sort of provide some facilitation to get the correct movement is is really important and, and works well. Um, providing ed education to family and carers, and again that uh, can be in the form of sort of a stretching plan. Um, a colleague of mine gave a really good piece of uh, feedback about uh, when you're viewing the carers doing the stretches for a patient, it really gives you an idea of how they're going to how they're going to do the stretches when you're not there, uh, which is what we're sort of aiming for so it enables you to sort of see clearly what they're what they're doing and, and, and you can give some advice quite clearly from a distance uh, and also again it helps to sort of you can use tele rehab to provide information on setting up things like electrical stimulation and tens for uh, weak muscles and sensory issues post-stroke Um, with vision, um, we've actually found that it can be quite easier to assess and see some deficits um, with eye movements, uh, particularly following a stroke. And also actually using tele-rehab, it feels less intrusive um, than often having to get quite close to a patient's um, face to see their eye movements clearly. Um, you can It's less intrusive as you can turn the camera off and um, sort of observe them moving their eyes from left to right, up and down, diagonally, um, to sort of assess their sort of gaze stability for one, for one reason. So that's a real benefit. Um, and also looking at their sort of peripheral vision, um, following a stroke in particular, um, a colleague, another colleague, an OT colleague mentioned about uh, screen, screen sharing, um, perhaps a, a picture of a, um, a setting or landscape on, on our screen and then having the patient sort of focus on the center of the picture and then kind of pay attention to their peripheral vision which I thought was a, a really good idea. I'll just I brought to outcome measures slightly into it but um, I won't spend too long on outcome measures but so the first few there on the list um, can be done sort of with this with the camera static um, and clearly, you know, making sure that their balance is appropriate, uh, then uh, th those can be done quite easily. Um, six minute walk I've included towards the bottom and 10 minute walk. Um, six minute walk in particular, I've often got patients to sort of go away and uh, measure their cells, um, how, how far they can walk over six minutes um, to measure their stamina. And then they can feed that back in the next sort of tele rehab session. So I'd just like to move on to some of the technology now that um, I've been using in practice. So I'm going to talk about some apps in a bit more detail. And um, clearly Zoom is very useful for communicating 
and um, some of my uh, colleagues that work in the NHS um, have been using Attend Anywhere, which seems to be getting good reviews and, and good feedback. Um, at Proactive Home Physio, I use a, a particular software called PhysiTrack, um, which is an exercise prescription program. Uh, it allows us to put together uh, exercise programs in video format, uh, which makes it more sort of accessible for some patients because um, they get to see the whole exercise performed. And they can also have it in a printed copy if they wish. Um, and they get a login code for a app or that uh, they can log into the website. Um, and then they can track, uh, they can enter their sort of data for their exercises that they're completing. Uh, and I can see that in sort of live time, um, which allows me to sort of monitor their progress at a distance and then track their sort of adherence with the exercises. And then we can uh, have a consultation over the telehealth option. Um, so I've just got a few sort of screenshots now of the software. So I really, really like using this tool, this software, because it is so easy to use and the clients really love it as well. So you can see from this screen, that it's quite easy to um, assign a new exercise program uh, or start a video call. Um, this is a screen that allow, enables me to sort of put the patient's email address in and then they receive the link. And there's a just a um, screenshot of some of the exercises that potentially we've put together. And if you see at the top right of the screen, there's a sort of basket and we can edit the exercises to prescribe set amount of reps. This is from the patient's perspective. So this is what they'd see on their app. Um, so they've got the option to play the video and watch the exercise, and then they can press complete, enter their um, repetitions and sets in. And also there's a feedback option about how, how did it go? Um, and I get them to rate that. It's actually in the pain, like a vast pain scale, but um, I get them to rate that from sort of naught to 10 in terms of effort level. And then they can track their, their progress as can I. And I really like the, so the, how it presents. Um, this is just an example of the, the screen that the patient will receive when they're about to have a telephone uh, video call. And that's a tracking page that I can see of the patient's progress. So that's PhysiTrack. Um, another app that, that's uh, really useful at the moment, um, I encourage everybody to have a look at the, the link, um, is EXI. It used to be called iPrescribe, but it's um, recently changed its name. But it's uh, an app that allows you to it's a, uh, enter in your medical information. So perhaps you've got uh, diabetes or st stroke or Parkinson's. Um, and it allows you, it puts together a... Um, evidence-based uh, exercise program. Um, it's developed by physiotherapists as well, and it's NHS apps uh, library approved. And it's all designed about making you sort of reach your target amount of exercise for the week. And as you can see from the right-hand side of the screen, there's uh, different options to what exercise you can do. So if you're not, if you feel particularly sort of uh, motivated towards one, area than another you can choose what you want to do on that given day and it gradually gradually builds up your exercise to increase your stamina and it has uh, the option to uh, have the patient uh, collect their data and and submit it to you um, so you can sort of track their progress as well and then finally, um, another app that I've been using recently um, that helps sort of promote patients sort of self-management and maintain their activity levels at a, via sort of tele-rehab means is um, Clock Yourself app. So it's the, the, my elderly clients particularly like this one um, as it combines a sort of cognitive and physical challenge um, into a brain game that makes you think on your feet. <laughs> And there's a couple of links there to have a, have a look at that. It's really, really good fun. Um, the patient starts with their feet in the middle 
and uh, they pretend that they've got a, a clock face and they have to sort of step their feet to the to the numbers and um, you can change the sort of speed at, uh, steps per minute uh, you can add in upper limb tasks or cognitive tasks to to sort of increase the challenge but all of those um all of those software things i've been using recently um to sort of good effect and it really just helps patients sort of do something in their own time and really promote their self-management thank you that's um that's all from me thank you so much paul that was really really useful lots of questions for you um okay so next up we have sarah the speech therapy approaches Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah. I'm a speech and language therapist working for Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Um, and I'm just gonna be presenting on rehabilitation that I've been carrying out um, with people with communication difficulties post-stroke. So first of all, I just thought I'd go through the assessments and carrying out kind of assessments with people with communication difficulties via telehealth. So I've been doing a lot of informal assessments um, over telehealth rather than the formal assessments. So the informal assessments, I'm doing a lot of kind of reading comprehension, spelling and auditory comprehension. Um, there is the option obviously to do the formal assessments and how I have been carrying out when I've wanted to do the formal assessments is either holding the stimuli up to the screen and the patient can either point to it, or if you have a caregiver as well, that's quite helpful. They can tell you what the um, patient is pointing to, or um, else you can kind of post out the assessment. And again, you can do the assessment over telehealth, um, but again, you might need a caregiver there just to support you with the assessment um, and tell you what the patient is pointing to. Um, I've been carrying out kind of more formal assessments for higher level difficulty. So things like the Mount Wilga has been working really, really well via telehealth. So then I'm just going to go through different interventions that I've been doing. Um, so first of all, just looking at expression. So firstly, for people with aphasia, so telehealth is working really, really well, doing things like naming pictures or objects and using the queuing hierarchy. Things like repetition is working really well. And um, so I work in a hospital as well, but we obviously have the face masks and that's really challenging with the face mask, whereas via telehealth, they can clearly see what you're doing, which is really helpful for people, especially with apraxia. And um, we're practicing reading aloud um, via telehealth as well. Then lots of things like picture description, again, just holding up the stimuli, describing a sequence, um, semantic feature analysis works really, really well. Then lots of kind of things like naming from description, verbal fluency, and um, for those people with word finding difficulties. Um, and then just thinking about dysarthria. So again, using dysarthria strategies via telehealth, practicing repetition, reading aloud, conversation. Um, I've been doing articulation therapy as well via telehealth. Again, really helpful that they can actually see your face rather than the mask. Um, and then dysarthria therapy on the phone as well. So it's actually really functional therapy that you get to do via telehealth. It just kind of changes things up a little bit. Um, and then just thinking about therapy ideas for people with comprehension difficulties. So again, it's been working really well, kind of carrying out comprehension therapy for maybe kind of two keyword level and on. Um, so I've been asking kind of lots of yes, no questions for kind of two to four keyword level. Um, so kind of basic questions or semantic questions. Um, and then obviously working on comprehension as well, a paragraph level and just asking people questions on that. And then functional comprehension tasks, things like leaving people voicemails and seeing how they got on with that. It's just working really, really well, kind of going down that functional route as well. It has been challenging carrying out comprehension therapy with people with one keyword level. And I would, I kind of haven't done a huge amount of that because it has been a bit too difficult. I have tried it with the support of the caregiver there as well, but I think possibly face-to-face -face sessions work that little bit better um, if people's comprehension is kind of at one keyword level or below. Um, but then I've been carrying out lots of reading and writing therapy as well, so lots of functional writing and actually emailing as well. So rather than even having a video session, some of my sessions have just been over email or practicing emailing and targeting the spelling kind of via that route, which is fantastic. It is a bit more difficult if people are unable to write at all or if they're unable to write to dictation. Um, 
but obviously if you have a caregiver beside the person they can facilitate the session which really really helps um, and then also kind of reading comprehension targeting one to four keyword level is fantastic over telehealth it's a bit more difficult when you're working a paragraph level but you can share the screen so they are able to read a paragraph or the main thing that I've been doing is posting out paragraphs and then we're practicing working through it together in the session. It's also working really, really well for um, people on the ESD pathway. So we're doing things like discussing what to do in emergency situations. Um, obviously haven't been able to practice kind of dialing things like 999 or family numbers so that people can communicate in an emergency, but family members have supported with those types of goals. Um, providing education again via telehealth is working really, really well because often you have the patient and kind of family members around as well. So you actually get to educate um, the patient and the family together, which is fantastic. Also do a lot of support and conversation via telehealth. So you can still encourage lots of circumlocution, encourage the patient to gesture, draw, write, make choices. Um, and then also kind of I'm um, able to discuss patients' feelings as well via telehealth. So some people, when they have more severe difficulties, I've been posting them out pictures or showing pictures on the screen, and they're still kind of clearly able to kind of indicate how they are feeling. But again, sometimes you still need that support of the caregiver. So I was just going to go quickly through some case studies of people that I have been working with. So first of all, um, I've got Jim. So he's got quite severe apraxia of speech. He can repeat words, but he doesn't use any speech functionally. So our goal initially um, in our telehealth sessions was to use functional phrases or words to communicate his needs. So we were work doing the eight step continuum approach for that. And then I was also doing some picture naming for the nouns in the functional phrases. Unfortunately, there was really limited improvement in the therapy sessions and we carried out quite a lot of therapy. Um, so then I decided I needed to explore his feelings around his speech um, and his use of alternative means of communication. We had introduced alternative means of communication when he was an inpatient in hospital and he just didn't like it. So I really wanted to explore how he was feeling around that now. So what I did was I posted him lots of resources so that we could have that chat over telehealth. So kind of, as you can see here, different rating scales, pictures of feelings. I kind of used talking mats approach as well. Um, just to see what his views would be um, around using different means of communication, things like gesture, drawing, pictures, objects. And that really gave me a clear idea about how he was feeling. So then from that discussion, we kind of, our next goal was um, to use a pictorial communication book to communicate his needs. And again, we created that book together. I developed it and then I emailed that out to his wife who printed it off. Um, and then our therapy sessions at the moment is we're practicing using that book in conversation. He's doing fantastic kind of doing it with me. So he's kind of answering lots of questions that I'm asking and he's using it with his wife as well. So our next goal will now just to be building confidence to use that communication book with other family members. So then the next patient is Paul. He has moderate expressive and receptive aphasia. So the goals kind of that we set with Paul was to target his comprehension at three keyword level. Um, and again, I was asking kind of lots of yes, no questions at three keyword level, things like is a sandwich thinner than a cracker? I'd also kind of read him a story at three keyword level and ask him questions. And he progressed really, really well with that and achieved that goal. Also provided a lot of education to him and his family around um, aphasia and around how to get his message across. So we discussed that over the um, over the video calls. I'd kind of post out lots of information as well. I also found his wife and had a chat with her of things that she can do to support him to get his message across. And then also kind of posted, I have a I have had a stroke um, card, just so again, people kind of know how to support him when he was out and about. We also kind of wanted to work on his word finding difficulties. So our other goal was to use word finding strategies in conversation with family. So we did lots of semantic feature analysis. We practiced using circumlocution. We discussed the impact of the environment and time. And again, with this, he achieved that goal and is using the strategies now independently in conversation, which is fantastic. Um, and then the final goal was to reduce his word finding difficulties in conversation. And we did lots of things like naming from description, verbal fluency, describe similarities and differences. 
And again, now he conveys his message really clearly with less word finding difficulties, which is fantastic. Um, so then I just thought I'd go through Bill as well. He's got moderate spastic dysarthria. So I had one session with him via video call on his son's phone, but all the rest of the sessions have been on his telephone because his phone doesn't actually support video. But it's working actually really, really well over the telephone. He's really getting to practice using his dysarthria strategies, which are fantastic. We're still managing to do articulation therapy for those sounds that are a bit trickier for him. And he's fantastic. He kind of sits in front of the mirror at home and he kind of is looking at how all the muscles are working. Um, and then we're still very much doing functional therapy as well, practicing kind of using those dysarthria strategies on the phone. And then the final patient that I was going to talk about is Don. So he has mild word finding difficulties, but he was not fussed by these. He was using the strategies fantastically, um, but he had quite significant dysgraphia and he really wants to be able to write a birthday card to his wife particularly, but then to his children as well. So this was our biggest goal. So first of all, we needed to just sit down and alter his expectations. He really wanted to write quite an elaborate card. So we sat down and just agreed, let's just practice happy birthday, love from Don. So kind of his son did assist during the session. So we practiced kind of copying, writing the full words, then filling in missing letters and then writing to dictation. So we kind of very much followed that hierarchy. And he can now write a basic birthday card and he was so pleased that he could write it to his wife. Um, so that's everything. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, really good presentation there. Lots of ideas and case studies. Um, so the next presentation is from Philly and Haley um, regarding the OT perspective. Hello, I'm Haley. And I'm Philly. And we are specialist OTs in the Northamptonshire Community Stroke Team. Um, today we're going to talk to you about how we've adapted to remote working and ideas for completing uh, occupational therapy treatment via video and telephone calls. As Paul and Sarah mentioned, part of us adapting to remote working has involved us in completing initial assessments via telephone where appropriate um, to try and establish the patient's exact needs and then if face-to-face -face is required. Where possible, we will then follow up with sessions via telephone and or video call um, through using the Attend Anywhere platform. We then subsequently send activity plans and exercises via email prior to and following our sessions for patients to continue working on with the support of family or on their own. Um, so the following slides we're going to talk about today discuss treatment ideas for a range of areas within occupational therapy. Um, that both myself and colleagues have completed. So the first slide is about home assessment remotely and equipment provision. Um, we have a template worksheet which consists of house measurements which we can ask for carers to complete and send back to us via email. This form contains information regarding furniture heights, door widths, access points and so on and helps us identify possible adaptations that may be needed. We've also been able to gather information about patients' home environments by observing their home via video tour. We do this via a carer often, who can then show the space and rooms for equipment, for example, a hoist or a rail placement. Um, and if video calling isn't viable, you can always ask photographs uh, of the patient's home and get the carer or the patient themselves to send them via email. Um, once the equipment has been provided based on this, it may be possible to demonstrate the use of the equipment. For example, a colleague of ours has used online video clips um, to demonstrate how the equipment works and ask the patient and carer for feedback on this and how they feel using it. Um, you could also demonstrate for safety purposes via video. Also, to reduce the number of staff entering into patients' house, uh, homes and houses. We completed joint sessions, for example, one therapist attending remotely. Um, we've done this by a physiotherapist attending people's homes for the visit to assess mobility and then the OT joining remotely to assess their environment. Well, the next one is about um, treatment ideas for cognition. Um, so as discussed in a previous previous um, remote rehab webinar about cognitive assessment, the following areas can be treated um, with the same principles remotely. 
So just very briefly, attention um, could be done through worksheets sent via email prior to the session. Um, you can assess the setting up of the platform that we use um, as part of um, their treatment as well. Attention card games, um, divided attention exercises. So for example, um, giving the patient two tasks to do at once, um, either switching between the two um, and asking for target um, kind of words and things that they're looking out for in particular tasks. Um, so memory can also be treated again through games, um, complete recall tasks, so giving them words at the beginning of the session to remember and seeing if they can recall later. Um, and you can try and um, complete the education of compensatory strategies um, remotely as well. And that can either be done via video or telephone. Um, so executive functioning can also be treated uh, with problem solving worksheets, uh, pictures. You could complete um, organization and planning tasks and worksheets sent by email. Um, you could do money management tasks via video. Um, and also giving patients tasks for self-monitoring as well. Um, apraxia, again, sequencing tasks with errors put in. So the therapist could be following through with the task and putting some errors in um, for the patient to try and identify. And you could do object recognition tasks as well um, and gesture and imitation work. Um, and visualization and perception. So again, Worksheets could be sent via email, so we, we often send things like hidden object worksheets, um, inattention work, um, so like star cancellation, line by section, etc. Um, and also then orchestrating a busy environment in a functional task and seeing if the patient can, can see where objects are and follow through with the task in that busy environment. Um, and most of those, if needed, can be done with a carer and liaising with them first, I guess, to set up the session um, and then following through with the patient. So Paul touched on upper limb, but um, I'll go through how we've used um, remote technology for upper limb as well. So um, we've asked patients to complete functional tasks while we're observing via video. Um, so this has included things like applying face cream, simulating brushing teeth, um, combing their hair, handwriting and cooking tasks, for example, giving them specific upper limb exercises they need to complete in between. Um, so you could do a joint session with the carer for stretching and assisted work. Um, so giving the carer um, a stretching plan by email, for example, and asking them to complete those over video call. And then you can also then feedback about their technique. Um, following assessment of upper limb, we would usually send out an activity plan with exercises. And then we complete video sessions where the therapist uh, can demonstrate the exercises for the patient to copy. So for example, therapist demonstrating reach and grasp, the patient then using household objects um, to copy that, that movement, and then the therapist can feed back on their technique. Um, and by using the video call, the patient can also observe their actions by watching themselves and then can better understand what their upper limb movements are like and see where their technique might not be effective. I've also completed uh, motor imagery sessions where I've read through a script for a patient to listen to and complete principles of mental imagery. And again, the patient within that can also attempt those movements at the same time if able. Um, and some of my colleagues have done um, constraint um, induced movement therapy. Uh, so they've done that by asking the patient to wear a glove on their non-affected hand and then completing specific tasks, for example, using a remote control, uh, doing up buttons on a shirt, and using their mobile phone, for example, to, to text. Um, and also eSTEM as well, as Paul said. So when set up from a face-to-face -face visit, normally we would set up eSTEM and then can follow that up with some remote sessions, um, incorporating reach and grasp in conjunction with it, for example. Um, we've also found remote rehab can also be utilized within functional activities. For instance, based on our patients' goals, we've completed a number of tasks remotely for upper limb treatment, cognition work, as well as building activity levels for fatigue management and helping patients establish routines. Um, we've completed kitchen tasks such as hot drink practice. Um, you can do this with a carer if it's needed for safety, as well as prepping uh, vegetables and meals, asking the carer to video the patient, but also um, you can get the patient themselves if they're able or a family member to set up a camera before the session. 
Um, as Finley mentioned earlier, you can also get patients to complete grooming tasks such as combing hair, brushing teeth, and applying makeup. These are all great for upper limb treatment, but also can be used to uh, treat cognition such as apraxia. Um, you can also ask patients to complete domestic tasks, for example, loading and unloading the dishwasher, folding laundry and dusting. Um, a lot of my patients have set goals related to their handwriting, um, and this is great over remote rehab. You can achieve this by sending handwriting sheets via email or asking the patient to say, repeat the same paragraph every week to try and monitor their progress. We've also found it quite useful to ask the patient to time how long it takes and the number of errors they make. And um, this is quite useful if you want to use it as an outcome measure. Um, in terms of medication management, you can send them medication tick sheets for patients to complete, um, but also complete remote sessions at the time when patients need to take their medication um, to either supervise but act as a prompt. Um, and you can do this in conjunction with carers to try and upskill and train those in that their area. Okay, so one of the patients where remote rehab was particularly useful for me was a 19 year old male who when he first started his rehab journey had approximately two out of five movement distally um, in his left upper limb. A lot of his goals related to activities involving bilateral movement and it's quite apparent that his attention was also significantly reduced and this was impacting quite a lot on his sessions with the wider MDT. Um, to work on both these areas in which he felt were both goal focused, I completed a lot of remote rehab incorporating his upper limb and functional tasks um, and I often completed these activities with him. Uh, being a young lad it tried to take the onus off of him. Um, one of the t sessions that I completed with him he he chose a muffin recipe and we both made this separately in a video call and this provided an opportunity for him to incorporate his upper limb but also worked on his divided attention between the task and the call. After the session we then sent uh, pictures to one another of our finished product via email and this allowed him to self-monitor but also uh, get a bit of self-achievement regarding it. Um, I've also completed workout sessions with him which incorporated exercises that provide a sensory feedback um, through the upper limb doing activities such as mountain climbers. And then to integrate cognitive elements, I would set a rule, um, for example, get him doing one exercise. And when I did a specific action, such as a clap, he would need to switch to another. Um, feedback from him was that he found these sessions really fun and whilst being goal focused also provided an opportunity for us to complete the sessions together. So case study two, um, just very briefly, how we've used um, remote technology within home visits, um, as we kind of briefly spoke about earlier. Um, so this chap is um, 62 years old. Um, he was discharged from hospital to a specialist care centre. Um, so there's some con concerns about his ability to manage at home due to physical um, speech and cognitive deficits. Um, so he lived alone prior to his stroke and now requires care for um, all of his act activities of daily living. Um, his stroke also resulted in no active movement in his upper limb and associated pain. Uh, so his main goal was to return home safely um, and we established this through kind of speech and language therapy sessions um, and lots of discussion with him about um, how, how we were going to manage that safely. Um, so through remote therapy a home visit was completed um, to assess his safety and we, we did this jointly with physio and speech therapy um, so the physiotherapist and speech therapist went on the home visit um, to assess mobility around the home and on the stairs and speech and language therapist to help with communication during the visit and to assess his understanding. And then to reduce the number of people present um, at his house in light of the, the current pandemic, I observed the session via video. Um, and again, this, this also helped him in terms of reducing that pressure. I mean, three therapists all at once in his, in his home environment could be quite overwhelming for him. So I was there um, remotely and I was there to look at his um, home environment for any equipment needs, um, checking safety of, kind of door thresholds and things like that. Um, and also um, he completed a functional kitchen task during the session so I could observe um, how he managed with that um, in terms of cognition and safety. Uh, so we were able to collaborative, collaboratively assess um, whilst using remote technology to reduce risk. 
So that's it. So thank you to our IT colleagues within um, within the team for contributing to the presentation with examples and ideas for treatment. Uh, for any further advice, uh, please email us um, or access Remote Rehab. Thank you, Billy and Hayley. Um, thanks for that presentation, really good. So next we have Ben and Martin talking about group therapy. Hello, everyone. Hiya. Okay. So my name is Ben Chetland. I'm an occupational therapist who works in a community head injury service in Aylesbury. And my name is Martin Hillier. I'm a placement consultant at the same service as Ben. That's a posh name for an employment specialist. <laughs> so today, Ben and I are going to talk to you a little bit about some of the groups that our service runs. Um, then we're going to move on to how we set up remote groups and then go on to talk about how we run the remote groups and then look at kind of our reflections as, as therapists in, in delivering these groups, evaluation work that we've done with our clients, and then kind of think about going forwards as well. Um, so this is just a, a little bit of a mind map um, regarding our service and the various groups that we run. We run an awful lot of groups in our service and our service has two teams. Um, one of these teams is a, a community rehab team and they run group sessions like a cognitive group, a fatigue group, educational sessions around brain injury. Um, the other team is our vocational team where Ben and I work. We run groups like a pre-vocational course, a work preparation course. We take um, groups of clients out into the community to carry out sort of volunteer work at places like WorkAid and a place called the Ahesi Foundation. And we also go to me and Ben's second home, which is Wadston Manor that you can see up there. Um, we also run job clubs in local job centres in Milton Keynes and Oxford. And we also run joint groups between the two teams, like a return to work group and a communication group. Um, the key points for our groups um, are, are kind of uh, here. 40% um, of our services contacts are group based. So that's a lot of contacts. Um, our groups cover a broad range of abilities. So it's key that we involve everybody in these. Um, our staff members when they run the groups are educating but facilitating them as well. Um, generally the groups are no bigger than 12 and the groups are run by our OTs, psychologists, um, myself, speech and language and our therapy assistants. One of the main reasons why we do this is because our clients say peer support is invaluable um, and their feedback says that social interaction is really really important for them. Um, one of the other important things, particularly for me and Ben, as we run a group every Monday morning is our Monday morning sports roundup. Without that, it's not worth running the group. And I'll, I'll leave you with that special thought there. <laughs> so we've been running our Monday morning work prep group quite a lot. And I thought I'd just run through um, the sort of things you might want to consider when setting up uh, a remote groups so there's going to be things like uh, using a laptop or a tablet uh, you could try it with a phone but we think that it's, the screens are probably a bit too small so it's probably best having a laptop or desktop computer um, so you need things like a webcam a headset a, a decent wi-fi connection and sort of a, a quiet sort of background environment as well so that all the clients can hear you and and some basic experience in video calls would be useful, but it's, it's not essential. Um, so then we, when we were setting up the groups, we had to consider what type of platform would be useful. These are sort of some of the platforms which we, we considered, but in the end, um, we went with uh, Microsoft Teams and Zoom groups. They just seemed to be sort of the ones that our clients um, were most familiar with and, and us too. So then when we were considering sort of, um, actually inviting the clients and how we go about doing this, we kind of ended up being in two stages. We had a sort of first stage, which was more of a screening, asking ourselves questions like what was the um, 
uh, what clients do we want to invite? Uh, asking them the questions on the phone, like have you used uh, video calling before? Trying to get a gauge of how much support they might need to uh, join the group to to set um, set this sort of thing up, and then we would follow that up with a email invitation, which looks uh, a bit like this. And even with this, we wasn't too sure. Do we give a lot of detailed instructions, or do we make it as, as simple as possible? Um, we thought maybe a bit more instructions would be better because a lot of the clients have cognitive difficulties. We thought we'd lay it out um, nice and uh, nice and detailed for them. But actually, we found that the simpler, the better for this. And, and that's the sort of thing uh, we email email out to our clients um, on a Friday afternoon, ready for Monday. So in the setting up, we come against come up against a few challenges, or our clients did, and we had to think about ways to support them. Um, so the sorts of things they had difficulties with were for understanding how to download the apps, how to uh, join the meetings, how to figure out the video, the mute button, uh, problems with accessing emails and that sort of thing. So um, and we looked at supporting people by sort of doing practice sessions with them, uh, trial runs and, and that sort of thing. So I'll pass you on to Martin now about uh, a bit more about running the groups themselves. So we're going to give you an example from one of our Monday morning white preparation groups. I don't know if you can zoom in a little bit for us, Ben. Yeah. Excellent. So and start of talking about staff. Generally, we'll have one or two members of staff running the groups. If it's one person, that person will welcome everybody in um, and, and kind of cracks on with running the session. If there's two members of staff, one person does the welcoming and settling everyone down and the other person's in the background helping clients who can't get in, dealing with any technical hitches, stuff like that. In regards to clients, the numbers, well, we need at least two because it's not a group if you've only got one, um, but we would attempt to have no more than 12 um, because it gets harder to run. So once everyone's there, you set off with the ground rules. So it, it's talking about things like, do you mute? Don't you mute? Raise your hand if you want to talk, take turns. This is all going to be confidential. We're then looking at introducing a session topic. Um, at the minute, we're running a series of eight COVID themed sessions. And then we're going back to a, a kind of more um, general themed session all around returning to work. So to deliver these, what we're looking at using is a range of different things, trying to make the session engaging, interactive and discussion full. Um, we want everyone coming back for more, hopefully. So we use handouts, we'll upload them, share them on the screen, have discussions, put in YouTube clips, um, might have activities, we'll use whiteboards on Miro um, and uh, we can kind of record discussions that we have as well. So the aims are to deliver the session for a range of different abilities, to get every client to contribute, to enable discussion and cover the topic and check that everyone's got it. We then sort of start to wrap up with a, a reminder for the next session and then we go out and gather feedback. Some, sometimes this will be every session, other times it's at the end of a, a, a series and we use things like emails and Google Forms um, for stuff like that. Um, this is an example of using Miro, which is a whiteboarding tool that we use in our groups and we use it with individual clients as well. We're happy to sort of tell people more about how to use it, but we use this to record the discussion in our group. So that big white bit, that's us talking about team working and our, our group's experiences of team working. On the left where the arrow is, that's us talking about good teams and bad teams. Down the bottom, we're talking about the negatives and positives of team working, especially in remote kind of uh, teams like a lot of us find ourselves in at the minute. Cool. You're muted, Ben. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We've been running these groups for about two months now. Uh, and so we, we kind of took the opportunity to take stock of what we've been doing. And um, these are sort of some of the pros and cons which we got. I'm not going to run through them because we probably got enough, not enough time, but we definitely found there was a lot of pros, even though the, sort of the technology side of it and it was being brand new for a lot of our clients to struggle with technology. It was really, really good. Um, and we found that there was some sort of vocational rehab 
kind of benefits to it as well. We feel like we're sort of prepping them for things like um, interviews online and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it also was giving people that social support, which they had, they'd been getting from the groups beforehand, but not so much um, during COVID times. Um, and there were some cons. It, it can be a bit time consuming setting it up and it was definitely better suited for the high level sort of cognitive abilities um, uh, sort of clients and and there, and there were some other things but generally we found that starting off simple when when doing this sort of thing and evolving it organically was the best way to go about it so our service ran a bit of a um we, we done a, a client survey on specifically sort of remote rehab and trying to find out a bit about how they felt about it all and these were the key points i thought would be useful for this talk here and and on the left it it shows that we um, clients from sort of naught to 12 months post injury found uh, using this sort of thing a lot less effective. They found it a lot harder to use it and they preferred face to face. Um, but on the right, we definitely had um, sort of some results which were showing that the majority of clients were finding it helpful. And it, it um, interestingly showed that it was significantly uh, sort of more strokes would say yes to groups compared to ABI. There's a, a few sort of nice comments, a mixture of comments, um, which I won't go through because we're a bit pushed for time, but you'll, you'll get the link after so you can see them. But it, it was um, sort of comments were around things like the uh, sort of sensory overload. People found it very exhausting being on a screen for so long, but others were saying actually just accessing that social connection via just a click was, was really, really helpful. Um, so it, the pulling it together a bit, we, there was a survey from Headway which went around about the impact of lockdown and we, it, you can see that actually people really felt like they were socially isolated, that they were denied vital rehab and, and we feel like running these groups went some way towards um, helping them people out. So, so going forward, just to wrap up, we, that survey, what we, we did showed that 62% of our clients really wanted a, a combination of face-to-face -face and remote rehab uh, groups um, going forward. So we're definitely gonna run more groups, more one-to-one -one sessions and that sort of thing. Um, and Martin's just gonna finish up by saying, yeah, so we're just trying to use a range of different tools, including Teams, Google Forms, um, and um, also uh, the whiteboarding platform, Miro, um, and sort of use these to, to try and deliver as dynamic content as possible to our groups. Um, and you can, we'll, we will share our slides via Miro, and there'll be a link to that for you to, to have a look at. I think that's us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you guys for that presentation, really good. So if all the panelists can come back on screen and unmute, then we'll get started with the questions, if that's okay. Um, we haven't got much time, so quite snappy with the answers. <laughs> um, so we've got one for Sarah. It says, are there any specific resources you use to educate patients slash carers? So there's not really any specific resources that I use. So usually when I'm educating the patient, I kind of tailor it to their level of communication, of comprehension. And then I often signpost um, the carers or the family members to things like the Stroke Association. I also have a list of YouTube videos as well of the different communication disorders that I often give to family. Um, that they can have a look there and then also I quite very much tailor so if I'm sending out any pa patient specific information and strategies I very much tailor that to the patient rather than them getting loads of overall information that they only have the very specific things that relates to the patient that's quite helpful for them so I kind of have like an outline and then I just amend it for each patient. Thank you. Um, have a question for Ben and Martin. Did you encounter any digital governance issues regarding use of the video platforms for group provision, as this is a challenge that they're having locally? There were some issues, weren't there, Ben? Um, the mm -hmm. first one was whether to use Zoom or Teams. And we'd get a message one week saying use Teams and then it'd be use Zoom and then Teams and then it was a bit chaotic. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we find that we um, 
asked all our clients if they were happy that other people might see their email addresses. Um, we share our email addresses with clients anyway. Um, so in regards to that, we kind of covered all of that with the clients, made sure they were happy and knew what was going to happen. Yeah, and we also worked to IT, didn't we? The IT department who was looking to roll out something like this for um, sort of clinics and consultants. And so we were, we sort of volunteered to be a bit of a guinea pig as well for sort of the IT project team. So we kind of had their back in with this, this uh, type of thing as well. Yeah, They're working to, on. Good to get yeah. in on board with IT, wasn't it? That really kind of Definitely. did it for us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, got a question for Paul. Um, how do you risk assess for balance um, and how safe do you feel tele-rehab is for balance? That's for Paul. Yeah, I think um, most of the, from experience, most of the patients I've been using it with um, have been ones that I've been familiar with. Um, so I know sort of their limitations and capabilities. Um, so yes, I would advise you know, only using it when you have a um, good background knowledge of the patient's ability really. Um, and to, yes, I do feel it's uh, safe. Um, clearly, you have to think about issues like uh, cognition, but then that comes in again to sort of knowing your patient quite well um, and asking those sorts of questions like, you know, how well do you feel we're going to, how confident do you feel we're going to uh, manage this next exercise? Um, again, if a family member or carer is there to support, then then even better, really. But um, yeah, it's always keeping safety at the, the forefront of your mind before uh, attempting anything really. Thanks, Paul. Um, this is for everyone, but I'm going to focus it to the OTs first and they can, <laughs> then we can open it up. Um, we've had some questions around um, training for family members. So how easy that's been and um, what type of things are good to train family members? What what you've and what your experience is. So if we start with Hayley and Philly. Um, so in terms of the education, um, families are quite keen to be involved anyway. And if we were going to do face-to-face -face sessions, generally we they would be there um, to, to ask questions and to be involved in their therapy. So it's actually working quite well remotely anyway. It's, it's a similar principle, they're there to support. Um, and it's just things like teaching them how to, how to do epidemic exercises with the patient um, in terms of cognition. It is just, if we're using a functional exercise, we're, we're teaching them the principles of how to, how to grade attention work, how to, to look at the particular deficits that are involved. Um, and it might just be that they're there for a session watching how we do it, and then they can then continue doing that as well. Um, we do have several kind of activity plans for family, for carers um, to follow as well. Um, and that could be based on functional exercises with cognition, um, picture plans for upper limb. So they're getting involved in lots of different ways, um, but it's just specific to the patient looking at, you know, the, the family member coming in on the remote sessions and then following, following the same principles that we're doing in the sessions, really. Thank you. I've got three more questions in two minutes. We can, we can do it, guys. <laughs> so um, this is to everyone, I think. Have you thought about incorporating VR um, tech to help have smart remote consultations? And I think, shall I answer this one? Or does anyone else have any ideas? I think within the independent sector they've been using quite a lot of vr um and it's something that we as a, a platform in terms of remote rehab are really trying to look into to see how accessible that is but from the panelists silence in the nhs i don't think it's something that we have that much access to shall i say that hmm. yeah i yeah. agree with that yeah <laughs> okay um and the next question um, it's for Ben and Martin. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on why you think stroke clients may have been more open to groups than those with ABI. Do you think this is reflective of ABI clients maybe having a greater likelihood of cognitive deficits, which potentially impact ability to independently access tech? 
Oh, we always yeah, win. I, yeah, I'll say this one. <laughs> I, I think that it probably reflects, that survey reflects uh, sort of our clientele. I think our ABI clients that so we, we have from sort of uh, childhood brain injuries where the strokes are often a bit older. So I think that it's, it's I think what I, I took from it was that the strokes have probably got some sort of pre-morbid ability to use this sort of thing. They've got some experience of using uh, tech in their work before and, and that type of thing, where maybe a, few, a bit less of the ABI clients had that experience before. I but think as well, sure we, we tend to see um, stroke patients further down their recovery path and ABI clients sooner which may impact on that. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, last question. We're, we're at eight o'clock, um, but how regularly are you seeing your patients daily, weekly, and how long are the sessions? So if we just go around quickly. I think um, really it's not daily, but perhaps uh, weekly really, because I'm, I'm trying to sort of encourage the patients to manage their conditions themselves. Um, uh, hence why sort of some of the apps that I use and really enables that you know for them to go away and work on, on, on various things and then come back to us for a, a review weekly okay I'm gonna end it there because I know everyone's got a lovely hot summer evening to go to but I want to thank all the panelists for sharing their views and their perspectives um, really really informative webinar um, if you have any other questions for the panelists, most of them are on the Remote Rehab platform. So if you join, you get a month's free and you can interact with our all member chat, with our um, groups and really kind of upskill yourself quickly in Remote Rehab. If you have any questions for the panelists, you, you, you can come through to um, contact at rrc.life and we can forward any questions to them and get back to you. And again, if you join our mailing list, which is in the chat, then you'll be able to get all the slides and uh, the, the videos. So thanks again. And I'll speak to you next week for our next webinar, which is on positive mindset. Thank you.